Students, please gather your notebooks and pencils and be ready because class is about to be in session. I am your professor for this lecture and today we are going over UFC 290. You can refer to me as Professor 138 MMA and we are going to cover this card in its entirety. Last week was a fun one, a wild card. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter, 138MMA, Tapology, same place, patreon.com slash 138MMA, and even better now, you can become a channel member right here on YouTube as well. Uh, last week, something that I want to point out, it's okay to lay chalk sometimes, guys. My $14 to win one on Joe Anderson Brito Cash, and guess what I did with that $14? I went down to the convenience store. I bought myself a $1 scratch-off lottery ticket. And guess what I won? Guess what I won? A free ticket. So I scratched off that $1 free ticket and guess what I won from that? Nothing, not a single thing. So it actually didn't end up paying out for anything. But you know what? Sometimes it's okay to lay some chalk, guys. That's all right, enjoy the card. We're gonna go over the whole thing from top to bottom. Like I said, find me on all the stuff. We'll see you in the first Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. Kemala Kirk taking on Esteban Rimovich. For Rimovich, he is 4-1 in the last five. His only loss in his entire career actually came in his last fight to Roik, Loic Radzibov. Uh, for Kemal Kirk, he is 3-2 in the last five. Uh, in this one here, we've got Rimovich, who I think is the better striker overall. He's got good power, works the body, switches stance. A lot of times he'll switch stance to land kicks from the other stance. Um, and he works in combination, which is good, it's important. Um, when he gets to the grappling, he has decent takedowns. But he's going to look for that Kimura, whether he's on top or if he's on bottom. If he doesn't lock up the Kimura, he's going to use it for a sweep from the bottom. Um, but his takedown defense isn't exactly the best. But in his last fight, as we saw against Radzibov, he's able to get back to his feet pretty well. Uh, so for Rivovich, more of a striker, but he does have that pretty good uh, Kimura. Uh, on the Kirk side, Kirk is a, he's a good striker with a lot of power, but he lacks a ton of volume. He doesn't have volume. He doesn't throw. He's really patient, which is good, but it's, he's almost too patient. Uh, but he's got he's got a good head kick. He'll work the body with his strikes, and he'll throw in combination when he does throw. But the problem is his hands are usually low, and his striking defense is poor. But he's good in the grappling department. He's got pretty good jujitsu in his back pocket. He likes to strike, but he, he uses the jujitsu if he ends up there. And his takedown defense isn't great, but that's okay because he wants to use that jujitsu there. But his takedowns offensively, they're just all right. They're decent. Okay, uh, for me. I don't understand the line movement. Uh, you guys are trying to get me to bet a lot on Rimovich, so uh, somehow he, he, he's get, it's getting closer. Money's coming in on Kirk. So Rimovich is my pick. I feel pretty good about it. I can see him getting chin checked because I mean, you know, give him a look at Kirk does hit hard. I can see it, but I feel pretty good about Esteban Rimovich here, especially if you're gonna give me him at like minus 140. So for me, Rimovich is the pick. Let me know if you think I'm missing something because I don't know, maybe I am. Uh, but also, real quick, like this video if you haven't done it already. I appreciate you guys very much, and I'll see you in the next one. Right we have Shannon Ross taking on Jesus Aguilar. And we're going to do a little draw along here, okay? So for Aguilar, he's 4-1 and one in the last five. For Shannon Ross, he's 2-3 and three in his last five. Now, for Jesus Aguilar, he's a good wrestler uh, with a lot of scrambling ability. He's going to shoot a ton of takedowns, scramble if he ends up on the bottom for some counter wrestling, gets taken out himself, whatever. And he's also got some good sweeps from his back. The thing is, he's a guillotine specialist, so if somebody shoots a takedown on him, He's gonna go for that guillotine, or if he gets on top, he's gonna look for that guillotine from the top. That's what he's looking for. Now, at least four of his eight wins are by guillotine. I know six are by submission. It's four or five that are guillotine. I can't remember which, um, and I know he has at least one other one in there that's not a guillotine. But either way, the dude's got good submission ability, and he's good with the scrambles. He's good at chokes, whatever. Uh, for his striking, he's, he's all right. He's got good forward pressure and throws a lot of power shots, which is good, uh, especially going up against a guy like Shannon Ross, who has durability concerns. So we're gonna go ahead and mark that here. So power shots, durability concerns, okay? But he does get a little bit wild and he's open to counters, okay? So Jesus Aguilar, wide open to counters. Now, when you're looking at Shannon Ross, the dude's got aggressive volume. He's coming forward with his striking, just one twos, one twos, because that's his best move, but he'll throw knees up the middle. Now, what are knees up the middle good for? Well, knees up the middle are good against somebody that shoots a lot of takedowns. So, takedown volume, knees up the middle, okay? Open to counters, aggressive volume, we're gonna use that as the one we're going to. And he's open to counters, okay? So we don't wanna be Jesus Aguilar shooting a ton of takedowns, eating knees up the middle and just one, two, one, two, okay? But on the Shannon Ross side, he's got good wrestling, okay? Good wrestling offensively, got good takedowns, but 
you know what happens if uh, Jesus Aguilar gets taken down. That one's kind of a wash, we don't know yet. But the takedown defense isn't that great. And against a guy that's gonna shoot a lot of takedowns, that may happen. Now also, another thing that's interesting, for Shannon Ross, he's got a ton of heart, right? The dude's, dude wants to keep going all the time, but sometimes his durability just doesn't hold up. The dude gets knocked out quite a few times, and he's going up against a guy with shooting power shots, like I said, or throwing power shots, like I said, in Aguilar. So here we've got two big things for Aguilar that I like, and we've got two big things for Ross that I like. And I've been seeing a lot of love on the MMA Twitter for Shannon Ross, and I understand it, I get it, I can see why people would be picking Shannon Ross just for, for the, the two things I pointed out here. But I think Jesus Aguilar is getting this one done, and honestly, I liked him when he was minus 200, and I like him a whole lot better now at his line of minus 140. Jesus Aguilar is probably getting this one done, and I feel pretty confident in that. I just don't think Shannon Ross can win a three-round fight with Aguilar. I don't think he can last three rounds if he's dealing with the power shots on the feet. And I think on the map, Aguilar is going to be just that much better than him. And I think that that's what the, is going to be the key. Whether he gets the submission or the knockout, I think Aguilar might even get a finish. So for me, give me Jesus Aguilar. I feel pretty good about it, especially because a lot of money is coming on Shannon Ross. And you can get Aguilar at a discount. Let me know what you guys think. Are you one of the people that are on Shannon Ross? If so, let me know why. And I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Thank you. 135 pounds. We have Cameron Simon taking on Terrence Mitchell. Mitchell's 5-0 in his last five, as is Simon, the undefeated fighter. Uh, with this one here, we do have a bit of a height and reach advantage on the Mitchell side. He is 5'10 with a 71-inch reach, as opposed to the 5'8", 67-inch reach of Simon. Interesting matchup here, because 15-2 and two is a heck of a good record. But we all know the level of competition up in the Alaska regional scene just isn't quite that good, and that's where Mitchell's been doing most of his fights. So, uh, nothing against him for that. I mean, you fight where you live, it's just what happens. But... Hasn't fought the highest level of competition, but here he is on short notice to take on Cameron Simon. Now let's start with Mitchell. He's a good, he's a good striker. He's got good kicks, nice long straights. He uses his length very well. He's typically a flyweight, but he's taking this on short notice, so he's moved up to bantamweight. I don't know how this dude makes flyweight. Dude's very thin, um, but he's got good grappling. He uses his long length to take the back of his opponents. Starts looking for the rear naked choke because guess what? He's got them choking arms. He can slip them right under the chin. You know how it works. Uh, the takedown defense isn't the best, and he can be held down at times with people uh, from people that have better top pressure. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the case here. I feel like we're going to end up getting a striking match, but I could be totally wrong. Uh, for Simon, the dude's got good striking. He works the leg kicks to accumulation. What do I mean by that? I mean, he starts landing leg kicks, and he starts building it up as the fight goes on to accumulate damage there, and that's what you like to see. Um, he's been working combination. He's got good volume and power to go along with those combinations. He'll put the knees right up the middle, but the biggest problem about Simon is he leaves himself wide open to be countered after he finishes an exchange. He is open, completely open. His hands aren't back here. He's just wide open to be countered. So that is a problem. I don't think Mitchell's going to have the one-shot power to take care of that, but it is there. Uh, good grappling as well. He can mix takedowns in with his strikes, and he definitely can scramble pretty well. Uh, I didn't write all that up there, but we're running out of space here. He's got good pace. Oh, real quick for a plug. If I didn't write all that up there, if you want to see access to all my notes, you can find me on patreon.com slash 138MMA where all of my notes are posted. Now back to Simon. He has good cardio. He has good pace, but he's a bit of a dirty fighter. Now I know a lot of people are going to give me give me crap for saying that. They're going to say, he's not a dirty fighter. He's just had some bad, you know, his last two fights in the UFC, his only fights or, you know, whatever in the UFC. He's getting points deducted, he's poking guys in the eyes, and he's kicking them in their nether bits. Well, guess what? That makes you a dirty fighter. Whether you're intending to or not, if it keeps happening, you're a dirty fighter. So, I do think Cameron Simon should win this fight. However, and I would be way more confident in him if I wasn't convinced that he wasn't going to get disqualified. At some point, the referees are going to say, man, this guy just keeps kicking guys in the junk and poking them in the eyes. Maybe we just disqualify him and maybe he learns his lesson. So, I wouldn't be totally... I would be more on the Simon side, but I'm not so sure about that. And I bet you can get a good line on Terrence Mitchell by DQ. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. I'm taking Cameron Simon. It's, it's, he should win. Uh, let me know and I'll see you guys in the next matchup fight. between Vitor Petrino and Marcin Pracnio. Uh, this one here, Marcin Pracnio is three and two in his last five, five and over Petrino because Petrino is undefeated. Uh, kind of an interesting one here because the skill and the physical attributes are kind of the difference here. Now for for Pragnow, he's got solid striking with a high level of karate in his background. He has, was like a hundred something wins in karate or something like that, which is cool and all. But here's the deal. Uh, with all these karate fights comes a detriment to the chin overall, apparently, because his chin is just not there anymore. Because he's been knocked out quite a few times. 
gets, seems to get knocked out pretty, he went on like a three fight losing streak of getting knocked out or whatever. So he seems to get knocked out a little bit easier than you'd want for a guy at 205, especially when everybody hits hard. But the skills are there. The dude's got good kicks, solid leg kicks in particular, but good kicks in general, pretty much to all levels. He circles off very well, kind of, you know, works his way out without too much trouble. Um, in addition to that, he can strike out of either stance and does it really well. But the problem is, I think it comes from his karate background. He has a clear reset after an exchange. Say he comes in, throws his combinations or whatever, and then it's clear reset. That's something that a guy can capitalize on and make make do with. And when they see that coming, they know how to how to go in, get their spots, you know, look for what they need. And he doesn't really have the best takedown defense, which we saw in Petrino's last fight. Then he's picked up the wrestling a little bit. He's been able to mix in his takedowns, kind of do what he needs to do there. Um, his takedown defense isn't that good, but he's been, he was able to work back to his feet as well. I don't, I, if anybody's mixing in the takedowns, I think it's more going to be the Petrino side, but that's just me. Petrino is a good striker, I would say. He's very dangerous in the pocket, swings powerfully, he hits hard, all that good stuff. And with a guy with a, with a suspect chin, that is a danger there. His striking defense isn't the best, though, and he keeps his hands kind of low. And I think a lot of times it's because he's worried about takedowns. Could also just be because he doesn't keep his hands high, but I don't know. I think it's because he's worried about takedowns. You let me know what you guys think. Um, but for me, I got to pick Petrino, but for as big of a favorite as he is, I don't feel as good about it because there is a world where Pacquiao just kind of stays outside, circles off, and just lands enough volume to get the win. Uh, but I do think Petrino probably finds the chin at some point, or if not, is able to mix in the takedowns enough that he can get the decision win. So I might just leave this one off entirely. Uh, for me, there's a lot of fights I feel good about, but paying the juice for a guy like Petrino eight fights in his career you know not really something i'm looking to do in this spot let me know what you guys think though are you more confident in petrino than i am do you think pracnia has got a shot here if so what are you thinking what are you where are you leaning um and i'd love to hear from you and i'll see you here fight. we have tatsuro tyra taking on edgar chatteris now in this one it is a 130 pound catch weight because of the shuffling of some stuff you guys already heard about it tatsuro tyra moving to this card instead of the last card he was on uh Chara is stepping on a short notice this is what we got uh, Let's we'll start with Tyra here. He's 5-0 in his last five. On the Chara side, 4-1. For Tyra, solid grappling. Um, he's going to work the body locks to get the takedowns typically, but he can mix in some different styles. But the body locks is go-to. He works to advance position and use that large toolbox that he has to take the back and start looking for submissions. A lot of times it's the rear naked choke is what he's going to uh, threaten with. Uh, but he's very quick to attack submissions. The guy's a very, very good grappler, okay? He's going to be able to get things done on the mat. Now, in the striking, he's not half bad. He's got a good calf kick. And something I really like is he'll fake the takedown and he'll come up into a flying knee. So it's like fake into that knee as he jumps. I don't want to do that. I don't want to knock something over, but you know what I'm talking about. So that can set up, can be set up with that fake takedown flying knee. Um, you can then start hitting those takedowns, start hitting those flying knees, mix that together, mix those options for him. Uh, for Charas, the dude is a good grappler. Don't get me wrong. He's got good jujitsu and a large toolbox of his own. But the striking is where he's going to need to get it done in this matchup. And what, he, what he's got is he's got good forward pressure, and he'll come in with a blitz when he's he'll, he'll constant pressure, but then he'll blitz, and then he'll keep back to the pressure. Pressure. So he does that pretty well. He's going to stick the jab. He's got a lot of power. He'll throw that one two after he stuck the jab quite a few times. Um, and the kicks are a good option for him as well. He can mix them up, go low, go body, go head, whatever he's got to do. We can get them all levels. Uh, but the leg kick's pretty good. Now the problem is his striking defense isn't great. I don't think it's gonna be a big issue here because Tyra's looking to get this fight to the ground, but the striking defense isn't great. For me, if I'm gonna make a pick on this one, I, I mean, obviously everybody says the odds are juiced. Hey, Tatsuro Tyra's like minus 900. If you bet nine bucks on him, you could win $1. Just like my lottery story, go down and get yourself a $1 scratch ticket and maybe you win a million. Or maybe you just lose like I did. Uh, but either way, Tatsuro Tyra is the pick. I, I mean, I don't think anybody's surprised by that. I think Chavez is a pretty good fighter, but I just don't think he's going to be on the level of Tyra here. Let me know what you guys think. I'd love to hear from you, and I'll see you hey, in the next fight. matchup here between Jimmy Crew and Alonzo Menafield. And if you've been watching this channel for a while now, you know that we've already gone over this in a class before. We've had Alonzo Menafield was the pick last time. That fight went to a draw. So here we are to do it all over again. Uh, we're going to see if I've made any changes after that fight. We obviously have a lot to go off of because they went three rounds, 15 minutes. And we got a little bit more to go off of here. So for this matchup here, light heavyweight fight, 3-1-1 uh, one one for Alonzo Menafield, 2-2-1 two, two and one for Jimmy Crute in their last fives. Uh, for Alonzo Menafield, he's a good wrestler with some powerful slams, uh, good takedown defense, and he works back up if he does get taken down. If he ends up on top of his opponent, he's got pretty good top pressure and some nasty ground and pound. Now, he does have decent striking. It's 
basically just powerful and fast, but it's super wild. Uh, but if he hits you, you're going to feel it. He's a very, very athletic individual, but his cardio does fail him as the fight goes on. Now for Jimmy Crew, he's a good wrestler, probably a little bit more technical in the wrestling because he doesn't have to just, he doesn't have to muscle it as much as Menafield does, but he does struggle with the top pressure. So he's got good takedowns, but once he gets a guy down, he's often let them up, including Menafield in the last fight. He let him up quite a few times. He does have good ground and pound volume though, and he can start looking for subs as well to try to get that finish. If you guys hear the fireworks in the background, sorry about it, it's that time of year. Uh, for Jimmy Crute though, is striking. Similar to the Alonzo Menafield, where it's decent and it's very powerful. I would say it's not quite as quick as uh, Menafield's. And I'd say his striking defense is, work, is worse, but it's also just a little bit sloppy as well. For me, this matchup is interesting because it is a draw. So obviously it should be lined pretty close, right? Because I mean, these guys fought once before and it went to a draw. But it went to a draw because Menafield had a point taken. Otherwise, he clearly won the first two rounds. However, Jimmy Crew probably won more minutes in the fight with the takedowns and the control, but the big moments were the ones on the side. It makes it a little bit more tricky to pick in the rematch, but I think because of the damage done by Menafield, I feel like he's gonna have more success doing just that. And the ability to get back up from Menafield in the, in the first fight, he's gonna be in his mind and say, okay, I can get back up, I need to work back to my feet quick and I need to start hammering this guy again. So I do like Menafield here as a slight underdog. I think it's like plus 100 or something right now. So I don't, I don't mind it, but I don't know if I'm going to play it. I haven't decided yet. Uh, I feel like Menafield should win. He would have won the last fight had he not grabbed the cage. Even if he had lost the round, as long as he didn't get finished, he would have won that, that fight. But he was dumb and grabbed the cage and got a point taken, rightfully so. You should get points taken when it stops the takedown. Uh, so yeah. Metafield is a pick, but uh, this is probably one of my least confident picks on the card. And I have a ton of confident picks on the card. This just isn't one of them. All right? I mean, these guys went to a draw last time. Let me know what you think. What side are you on? And I'd love to hear from you. I'll see you guys in straw weight. We have Denise Gomes taking on Yasmin Howriggy. Uh, real quick, have you guys heard about channel memberships? I'm sure you have. Maybe, I'm not the only one that has them. But channel memberships for 138 MMA, it's only $2.99. What are you gonna get with that? Well, you get these cool little badges that show your support to the channel. When you drop a comment down below, everybody sees that you've been around the channel for a while. And these badges, you level up in the, the amount of time that you've been here. It's kind of cool. You get access to some neato emojis. Occasionally I post something out there for the members only. Uh, but shout out to Pink Freud, who happens to be the first channel member on this channel. So that's super cool. Thanks, Pink Freud. I appreciate you. Hopefully everybody else follows suit. Now. Real quick, we're gonna get right back into this fight in a second, but if you wanna do the channel memberships, it's right beneath the video, just click join, no big deal, it's easy enough, only $2.99, helps the channel a ton. And anyway, let's get back to this fight. So, Yasmin Howregi versus Denise Gomes. Gomes is four and one in her last five, five and oh for Howregi, as she is undefeated at 10 and oh. For Gomes, she is a good striker with a ton of power and some heavy, heavy kicks. But she doesn't have the best striking defense, Thankfully for her, she's very durable as a fighter and she's gonna use a lot of forward pressure and just kind of overwhelm her opponents with that forward pressure, durability, and landing heavy shots. So although she's not the most technical fighter in the world, she's not bad, don't get me wrong. It's not like she's poor technique, but she's not the most technical fighter in this matchup, but she can come forward, eat some shots, and throw back heavy. Now she has decent grappling, she'll mix in her takedowns. She, when she gets on top, she does pretty well, but if she can get stuck on her back if she's the one taken down. On the other side for Howreggie, she's clearly the better striker here technique for technique. She's got quick hands, tons of volume, works counters as well as combinations on, like, when she's moving forward. So she's able to go strike backwards and counter or move forward and throw her combinations in her own right. Uh, very good striker. In the grappling, she's got a good body lock takedown, and, but in her takedown defense is pretty decent as well. I think Howreggie should win this fight everywhere. I think she's just the better fighter overall. But Gomes is a dog, and you can see her powering through, and I think if Gomes is going to win this, she needs to get it done late in the fight, third round finish, and I just don't see it. I think Hal Reggie is going to be able to, to hang on. She's been the war before with uh, Yasmin Lucindo, things like that. That was a good fight. I think Hal Reggie is going to be able to get it done, and I don't think she's going to struggle too much. I think she's going to throw a ton of volume and clearly win a decision. But I think Gomes is going to make a good account of herself by coming forward and landing some heavy shots, maybe even dropping Hal Reggie at some point. But I think it's going to be really hard for Gomes to get up on the scorecard. So for me, how Riggie's the pick. Let me know what you guys have, and I will see you in another short notice matchup on this card here. We have Josiah Harrell. He's taking on Jack Della Maddalena, obviously stepping in pretty short notice here. 
Uh, this was uh, this week even, I believe. So for Harrell, he's 7-0, 5-0 in the last five, obviously. For Jack Della Maddalena, he is 5-0 in his last five as well. Uh, Della Maddalena is going to have a bit of a height and reach advantage, 5'11", 73 and a half inch reach, as opposed to 5'7", with a 67 inch reach, which is a pretty big difference there. Uh, Harold's been a, uh, a guy that's been fighting at lightweight, but kind of missing weight. So uh, here he is at 170, makes sense for him. He's a good wrestler. He's got good takedowns, you know, uh, wor he works to take the back, looks for the ground and pound, things like that. Decent striking on the feet. Uh, the dude's got some solid legs. So if you look at that dude, you're like, all right, I can see why he could get those power and those takedowns. Uh, but he's going up against a guy in Jack Della Maddalena, who has some of the best MMA style boxing that you're going to find in the UFC. He's got good counters. He's willing to cut off the cage and throw some combinations that are very crisp. Uh, with doing so, he's going to work the body, come up to the head, mix it all in the combination. So the dude's got some of the better boxing that you're going to find, like I said, in the entire UFC. And he's got good enough counter wrestling that I think it's going to be hard for Harold to get this to the mat. We don't need to spend too much time here. I do think Jack Della Maddalena is going to get this one done. And that's not that Harold's a can or anything like that. I just, I mean, he's not ready for this. It's a big step up for him, especially on short notice, and he's moving up a weight class. Jack Della Maddalena is one of the better prospects in the UFC. So Della Maddalena is a pick. Let me know what you got, and I'll see you in the next 170, fight. welterweight division. Robbie Lawler taking on Nico Price. And this is kind of an odd matchup because Robbie Lawler, one and four in his last five. Nico Price, one, three in a no contest. That was originally a draw, but is now a no contest in his last five. It's kind of wild, isn't it? On a pay-per-view card, we got guys that have won and essentially one and four in their last five fights. Oh, well, anyway, interesting fight. Robbie Lawler, I believe this is his retirement fight. I don't know that he specifically said that, but I think he's kind of mentioned it. I'm not for sure. Let me know in the comments if he specifically said that, but either way, should be if it's not. Uh, 41 years old for Robbie Lawler, 33 for Nico Price. Now for Nico Price, he's a good striker with you know pretty good volume, pretty good power, uh, but he gets backed up and his striking defense isn't very good. But his volume and power, his output is pretty good. So there's that. Uh, from his back, he's got he's active with, the, with his uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, whether you're looking for submissions or we're looking to try to knock somebody out from his back, which he's done before. But he's not the most durable. I don't know. He's just not he's not the highest level welterweight, so there's that. And he hasn't looked the best in his last few fights. For Robbie Lawler, same kind of deal. He hasn't looked the best in his last few fights. But he does have good striking, heavy hands. The problem is he likes a brawl and his striking defense isn't there. He's got good wrestling in his back, po back pocket. I'm not going to go into it too much because I think this is going to be a striking matchup predominantly. Uh, but he's in a clear decline at this point in his career, and the durability just isn't there. His one win in his last five is over Nick Diaz, who, I mean, you guys watched the fight, right? He didn't want to be there in the first place. That was horrible. So for me, I don't think that that's a really good win. Uh, for Nico Price, I can't remember who his only win is, but either way, he also hasn't looked that good in his last five fights. So. It's a tough one for me to pick, really, because I, I genuinely think that I would probably fade either guy against just about anybody else in the division. But I'm going to have to go with Nico Price just for being way younger, and it's not necessarily his retirement fight. So I'm going to have to go with Nico Price. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't understand. I don't know. I don't understand why people are still betting money on this one. This is one you want to stay away from just because either guy could get knocked out because neither guy's super durable. So do yourself a favor. Use this fight as a good opportunity to crack open a nice ice cold root beer. Kick them feet up on the coffee table and just have yourself a nice little time. You can use the root beer emojis down in the comments if you happen to be a channel member. But let's go ahead and get on to the next fight. Let me know who you've got in this one and I will see Middleweight, where we have Bo Nickel taking on the very short notice replacement of Val Woodburn. This, this fight was actually announced today and this is why this video is going to be just a little bit later. Um, it's still going to come out today. Obviously, I, you don't know when I'm recording this, but I'm recording it Tuesday, July 4th. Now. Uh, this fight is going to be uh, kind of an interesting one here because Val Woodburn is taking this fight on super short notice, but I think he might actually be a more challenging test for a guy like Bo Nickel. Not because he's necessarily better than Treshawn Gore, but I think that just the style does make it a little bit tougher for a guy like Nickel. Now let me go over this one here. So both guys are undefeated, 7-0 for Woodburn, 4-0 uh, for Nickel, nearly double the amount of fights for Woodburn. That hasn't been a problem for Nickel in the past, but... Woodburn is a powerful striker. He's very unpolished, but he throws these big, wild, looping hooks, and he's powerful when he lands. He hits pretty hard. Um, his first few fights were all just early knockouts. Now, don't get me wrong, that's great for doing tape study on a 7-0 guy because you can breeze through him in a, ma a matter of seconds, <laughs> but it doesn't show you a lot about his game. But you do see the style at which he throws his punches, and it's a lot of big, looping shots. Now, later his fights, 
what they do is they become wrestling matches where he likes to push guys up against the cage and just kind of grind on them, hold them there, use his physicality, and then play in a big elbow when he wants to separate and then come back off, you know, and then big looping shots, get back to the cage push. That's what he likes to do. Now, is wrestling with a guy like Bo Nickel going to be a good idea? No, not, not even sort of. But I do think his physicality, and he's a shorter guy. I didn't get his exact height and weight. I couldn't find all that on the, uh, or not weight, but height and uh, reach and stuff. Couldn't find all that. Um, every video I watched of his stuff, it was just kind of slightly off, so or like slightly different. But either way, he's going to be shorter than Nickel here for sure. But he's able to get down low on guys. He's hard to take down. So uh, at least from what I can tell. Against a guy like Nickel, though, dude's got very high level wrestling. He's gonna faint those takedowns, and he's gonna do that in order to get guys to freeze. Faint the takedown, make you think, oh shoot, if this guy gets the takedown, it's over. Well, he's got near perfect takedown entries as well, so his takedowns are absolutely excellent. This guy is fantastic when it comes to that, and he showed improved submission abilities throughout his career. Now, his last matchup with Jamie Pickett, it took him a while to lock in the sub, but he figured it out right there in the fight without panicking, without freaking out, without losing his, his cool. Uh, but we also saw in the Contender Series in his Donovan Beard matchup where he was able to switch to a triangle. Probably not the best move, but he did it very well. Typically, you don't want to give up top position unless you're for sure you're going to be able to lock in the submission, which he was. I would have just stayed on top, kept in the mounted triangle, and landed shots. But that's just me personally. What do I know? Bo Nichols fighting in the UFC, and I'm just some dude on YouTube. So either way, for Bo Nichols, he's showing improvements in his game. His, te his, his wrestling is really what's going to win him fights at this, this point in his career. Now, his striking, it's set up by the threat of the takedown. If he wants to go in there and outstrike Woodburn, he's going to have every opportunity to do so. He's going to be the longer, rangier fighter, and that feint of the takedown is going to get those hands to open up over the top. And guess what? A guy like Woodburn, who throws big looping shots and also is shorter, is going to be able to get pieced up on the outside by a guy like Bo Nickel. I think Bo Nickel wins this fight no matter where it takes place. But I think he's going to have a harder time. I don't think he's just going to steamroll this guy in the first two minutes like I was thinking he was going to do against Treshawn Gore because Treshawn Gore was going to get taken down and beat really fast because that's just what was going to happen. Uh, but Woodburn's probably going to be around just a little longer. Now, either a late first-round finish, maybe second-round finish could be possible here. But I think Nickel's going to struggle to get the takedown if, he, if that's what he does right away. In fact, I actually think we're going to see Bo Nickel go out there and use his striking, but off the feints of the takedowns. Get, get uh, Woodburn worried about that, kind of faint some shots, come up top. I think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see Nickel put on a striking match in here and use that length that he's going to have over a guy like Woodburn and maybe start scoring takedowns later in the fight. But that's my prediction. Bo Nickel's going to win the fight. I don't think that's a big surprise. Uh, let me know what you guys think. If you think Woodburn's got a shot, hey, I understand it. I get it. You're you know rooting for the underdog here, but I, I don't see it at all. Let me know, and I'll see you in the next We fight. have Dan Hooker taking on Jalen Turner. Turner's 4-1 in the last five, two and three for Dan Hooker. Now for this matchup here, I initially had a whole lot more notes, but I decided to put these up on the board. I was originally going to make this one of those standalone videos where I break this one down in depth because I do really like this matchup here, but I didn't have enough time, so it just gets put on this video here. But you can see the rest of my notes over at patreon.com slash 138MA if that sort of thing interests you. If not, hey, just watch this. We're going to go right into the breakdown. So. For Jamie Turner, he's a good striker and he's gonna use his range well. And he can back guys up while using long straight shots, keeping guys at the end of their at, a, at the end of his punches, but still moving them backwards. Now he's got good knees up the middle as well. He's got tons of pow power with his volume. Guys is a threat to knock just about anybody out. And typically he's gonna have a pretty big height advantage, but in this matchup, both guys are pretty long and tall. So it's gonna, you know, kind of negate that some. So the knees up the middle might not be as big of a weapon for him in this particular matchup. Now his grappling, he has very slick front chokes, and that's interesting because if, when somebody wants to shoot a takedown on this guy, yeah, he's going to try and sprawl out and stuff the takedown, but instead of just stuffing the takedown, he's going to try to lock in like a Darce, a guillotine, an anaconda, whatever he's got to do. He's going to try and lock in a front choke, and he's very quick on them and has a good job. He's also very hard to hold down once he is taken down, and if he gets on top of you, his ground and pound is pretty nasty. Now, for Dan Hooker, skill for skill, I think he's the better striker, but... It's going to be interesting because in this matchup with Jalen Turner, there are some variables that we'll get into in a moment. Now, skill for skill, I think Dan Hooker is the better striker. He's got good counter striking. He's very accurate with his shots. He's got good forward pressure and will blitz in with these big one-twos just like that. Uh, but he's got good leg kicks, and he'll work them from the start of the fight through accumulation, going to the calf, going to the thigh if he has to. We go to the calf a lot of the time, and he's going to establish his jab early in the fight. Now, 
His combinations, he throws all of his strikes in his combinations, whether that's the punches, the kicks, the knees, the elbows, everything. And I think that's because he has that Muay Thai base. That's his kind of his base striking, which is pretty good at emphasizing using all of your strikes. Now, Dan Hooker does a phenom uh, phenomenal job of doing that. The blitzes, though, when he comes forward looking for that kill, I can see that being a moment where Jalen Turner can use that power and that lead hook that he has, that check hook, to put some damage on a guy like Dan Hooker, who we have seen chin checked recently in the Arnold Allen fight. Now, was down a weight class, I understand, but either way, that could be an opening for a guy like Jalen Turner. So this does make it pretty even on the on the feet because I do think that the the, the ability to get chin checked is more there for Dan Hooker. He's, he he is a little more open to be hit. He is a little bit more. I mean, we've seen him drop pretty hard recently. So there is that. Now for Jalen Turner, that lead hook is a pretty good weapon of his. So I can see that being a case, but I think skill for skill, Dan Hooker is the better, more polished striker. Now when it comes to the grappling, he's got good submission defense. So if Turner wants to lock in that slick front choke that he's got there, the defense for Hooker is pretty good. And I can see him getting out of that, getting on top and landing some nasty ground and pound. And he's got some sick elbows in that ground and pound. And he can also work them off his back as well. He's also got good submissions uh, looking for the his, his chokes as well because he's got them choking arms. You've heard me say it before. He's got them choking arms. Both guys kind of do. But uh, this is a tough one because I think skill for skill, Dan Hooker might be better. But I think momentum is all in the favor of Jalen Turner. Sure, he lost that fight to Gamrot. Honestly, I thought he won. I thought he landed the better shots, did more damage. I don't think Gamrot really did a ton of damage. And he just kind of used a lot of takedowns, which it gave him the win. I don't think it was like a blatant robbery. I also bet Jalen Turner, so I was a little biased. But I thought Turner won that fight either way, whatever. But I think a lot of, I think his stock went up in that matchup. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of momentum is on the side of Jalen Turner. Whereas as Dan Hooker, he's coming off of a fight with uh, Claudio Poyes, who wasn't really at the level of Dan Hooker, so that, you know, the win doesn't hold up as well. And before that, he was kind of losing quite a bit, although it was to a lot higher level competition than he'd been, you know, than a lot of guys have been fighting. So let's put it this way. I think skill for skill, Dan Hooker's better, but I think the momentum's on the side of Turner, and I'm gonna just slightly, slightly, slightly lean the Jalen Turner side, and I could be flipped on this one. If you've got a good case for Dan Hooker, let me know. And in fact, I might even bet Dan Hooker, even though I'm picking Jalen Turner, if the odds keep swinging for, or keep going in the favor of Jalen Turner. Because if you give me Dan Hooker like plus 300, you bet I'm going to be betting him. Because even even though I'm picking Jalen Turner, Dan Hooker's really got a shot in this fight. And I know a lot of people were counting him out. So let me know what you guys think. I really wish I had time to do a full deep, deep dive into this one, but I just don't. Another 20 minute epic, you know what I mean? Let me know who you guys have. I'd love to hear from you and I will see you in the next. Middle wait, we have Robert Whitaker taking on Drickus Duplessis. Now for Duplessis, is 5-0 in his last five. Robert Whitaker, 4-1 in his last five. And this matchup has been very interesting to hear from, from the folks of Twitter, uh, the people of the internet. Because there's been a lot of real hot takes. A lot of people are just, Whitaker slaughters him. And a lot of people are like, D you know, Trinkus Duplessis is a very live dog. Guy's got value on him, all this stuff. So we're going to kind of break this down. And I think I've got a, an interesting take here that I think I can explain where some of this is coming from. So for Duplessis, the guy's in pretty good striking. In fact, he has that K1 background. But it doesn't look as polished as you'd like to see. But it's effective. It's very effective. And he's going to strike in flurries, come right up the middle with that pressure. Lots of power, lots of volume when he does that. Now, the grappling, he's good there as well. He's got very heavy ground and pound. So if he can get on top of you, that ground and pound is there. He can sweep off of his back, get back to the top, and start landing that ground and pound. And the front chokes are something that kind of gets uh, kind of gets overlooked because we haven't seen a ton of it in the UFC from him. But he does have darn good front chokes. Now, the thing that makes Drinka so dangerous is he's very durable, and he puts a very high pace on guys. So even when he's tired, Drinkus is coming forward. Drinkus isn't slowing down. He's going to keep coming at you. He's going to keep coming at you with volume, flurry, volume, flurry. Get that, you know, get in the grappling exchange. Doesn't matter. He just keeps on coming at that pace regardless of how tired he is. And that's a very important thing. Uh, got other guys that do that, somebody like, um, for example, it's a less polished version of, say, somebody else on this card, and Alexander Volkanovsky, who, when he's tired, he still keeps the same level of volume. You don't see him slow down, but he does get tired. He does, but he doesn't slow down a bit, and he just keeps that same pace and volume. Now, Duplessis is not Alex Volkanovsky, don't get me wrong, but it's the same style. That pace just keeps there regardless of how tired he gets, and he can take a shot, so that helps him a lot. Now, for Robert Whitaker, the dude's an excellent striker with great lateral movement, and he stays light on those toes. 
kind of a hybrid between a Muay Thai stance and a karate stance. It's very interesting because you know, he's, he's, you know, more square up, almost like he's Muay Thai, but he's light on the toes and kind of bouncing like a karate stance rather than the, you know, the Thai stance, like whatever. Um, and it's not like your traditional kickboxing, American style kickboxing stance or anything like that, where you've got more like a boxing stance because he's up like way up on the toes, more in like the karate bounce. So it's an interesting style um, and it allows him to do a lot of things with that movement. So that it's important for him. Now he does have solid kicks and that head kick is lightning fast. Don't worry, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. A decent wrestling for Whitaker. So he's hard to control when he's taken down. He works to get back up. You know, hard to get down in the first place. Can circle off the cage, things like that. Uh, but also he can mix in his own takedowns for a change of pace. Now, here's something I wanted to highlight. Now he switches between two different styles of the slip and counter style, where opponents throw at him, he slips it and comes back with his own strikes, or where he uses a blitz. Now the blitzing style, when he comes in, he is wide open to counters, and we've seen him dropped in the past while doing his blitzes. Now his blitzes are very effective when they work well, and when he when he times them right, he can land some big shots on an opponent, stumble them, wobble them, get them down to the mat with uh, with you know some pretty good shots. But he's been hit when he does these blitzes, and that's what the Drikas Duplessis betters are thinking. They see a guy like Whitaker getting caught when he does one of these big blitzes and comes in, especially because he's you know darting in real quick, throwing a big long shot, and his other hand's already ready to come out. He can get hit in that in that moment. And that's where the Drukas Duplessis betters are coming from. And I totally understand it because I can see it. He does have the puncher's chance in that in that sense. However, here's what they're missing. Is that Robert Whitaker is a much smarter fighter than I'm giving, giving him credit for. And I understand that he does tend to blitz and gets caught in those moments. But I think that he's going to do enough tape study on his opponent, and or at least his coaches will. And he's going to understand that he needs to use his slip and counter style a lot more in this matchup. And I don't think he's going to be going in with that blitzing style often against a guy like Drikas Duplessis. I think Robert Whitaker has the skills to make this look easy on the feet, and he has the skills to make it tough on the mat for Drikas Duplessis and get back to his feet when he needs to. I do think in a pure grappling matchup, Duplessis might actually get, be able to get it done, but Robert Whitaker's not bad in, on the, in his grappling, don't get me wrong, but Duplessis is underrated in the grappling. I just don't think that's what we're gonna get. I think we're gonna get Robert Whitaker using his striking ability, using those quick head kicks that he's got, landing a couple of them up on, upside the dome of Drikas Duplessis, and he's going to slip a lot of shots, hit that counter. Duplessis is going to have a lot of trouble working against a guy like Whitaker, who's so good with the lateral movement when he comes in with the flurries. I think that's what we're going to see is a lot of movement, slip and counter style. And Robert Whitaker is going to get this one done. I understand, like I said, the open to counters off that when he does that blitz, but I just don't see that in this matchup being the, the way that it goes. So let me know what you guys think. If you're a Duplessis better, let me know, did I sway your opinion at all? If so, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. I've swayed a few people in the past, and for some of them, it's been better. So, hey, I swayed a few of you on the Grant Dawson pick last week, and you're welcome because, I mean, I didn't do super well on that card last week. There was a few missed spots, but the Grant Dawson pick was one I was very confident in, and a lot of people made a lot of money on that. So I appreciate you guys for letting me know in the comments if you were a Duplessis e better and you're now switching to the Whitaker side, or if you were a Whitaker uh, better and you said, oh, shoot, that counter is there. And you're going to take the value play on the Duplessis e side. Let me know what you think. I'd love to hear from you. Guys, co-main event of the evening. We have Brandon Moreno taking on Alessandre Pantoja. And a quick reminder, hey, if you made it this far in the video and you are enjoying yourself, go ahead and give a straight cross right to that like button for me. I appreciate it very much. Now let's break this fight down, shall we? Now, oh, but real quick. Obviously, this is a either a rematch or the third matchup between these two. So depending on whether or not you count the exhibition match on the Ultimate Fighter, for me, that fight happened. It was a fight that did finish in that matchup. So for me, I'm going to be counting it. This is the third matchup by my estimations, and Pantoja won both of them. He finished him on the Ultimate Fighter, and he did get the decision in a pretty dominant matchup in the rematch um, later in the UFC. Now, 3-1 and a draw for, for Brandon Moreno in his last five fights. 4-1 for Pantoja. Let's break this fight down a little bit. So... On the Pantoja side, he's a solid striker with a nasty calf kick, and we saw him use that to great success in the rematch between these two, slowing down the movement of a guy like Brandon Moreno. He's got a good forward pressure, and he's going to work the body with both punches and kicks. When he's throwing his shots, he likes long straights, and he uses them very well, and he's incredibly quick on the feet. When it comes to the grappling, he's got spectacular transitions, scrambles very well, but he's going to ultimately look to take the back ground and pound his way to an open opening for the rear naked choke because that is his specialty. Pantoja is an absolute monster on the ground and he's very solid on the feet as well. Now for Brandon Moreno, 
The dude's a solid striker with beautiful combinations. He's got lightning quick hands and something he does really well that not a lot of guys can do well is mix up the same hand. Like the lead hand, he'll use it a lot where he can strike well from both that from that hand two in a row and land on his opponents. That's not something a lot of people can do. You can do it on the rear hand too, hitting the cross, maybe do an uppercut or a, a rear hook, something like that. He does that very well. Not many people can double up the same side shot and land it with, with the effectiveness that uh, Brandon Moreno does. He also is gonna draw out his opponent's strikes, kind of dipping his head down like this, getting you to throw, counter, slip it, counter it, and come back with a combination of his own. He does a very good job with that. Now he's also gonna work the body with both punches and kicks, which is important. Both guys do that well. In the grappling department, he's a good grappler. He's very control-based, looking to take the back, start working for the chokes, don't get me wrong, but he's gonna work for control before he starts doing that. Uh, the thing that Brandon Moreno has in this matchup that I think is going to give him the biggest sway, it's a five round fight, he's got insane cardio and he's very durable. So as the fight drags on, Moreno's probably gonna look like the fresher fighter. Now, what's gonna be the difference is over the course of those five rounds, if it gets that far, how many calf kicks has Brandon Moreno eaten? Because if you've eaten a lot of calf kicks, it doesn't matter if your cardio is great, if you can't really move that well, uh, you're kind of a sitting duck, even if the other guy's tired. Because if you can't put weight on that, you can't move, and you can't get out of the way of some strikes, I think Pantoja is going to be able to get him in the later rounds. However, if he's been able to dodge those calf kicks, check some of them, get the leg out of the way, whatever. If he's been able to do that in the fourth and fifth round, Moreno should be able to start pouring it on. So this is a close fight, don't get me wrong. Even though Pantoja's beaten Moreno twice, this is a very close fight. For me, here's the thing that's weird. Because, um, and I apologize for all the fireworks in the background, it's that time of year. Uh, the thing that's weird to me is I see a lot of people saying, oh, well, Brandon Moreno's improved greatly since that last matchup. Well, yeah, he has. But what do you think Pantoja's been doing? Sitting around and getting worse? That's silly. You're silly if you think that Pantoja hasn't gotten better. So either way, Pantoja and Moreno have both gotten a lot better since then. Pantoja was just ahead to begin with. Now, do you think that, that Brandon Moreno has completely leapfrogged Pantoja? I personally don't. I think Pantoja wins this fight at a pretty good clip. So for me, I'm gonna pick Alessandre Pantoja. However, if he doesn't establish the calf kick early, if he doesn't start establishing things that are gonna slow down a guy like Brandon Moreno, maybe the body kick as well, calf kicks and body kick. If he doesn't start establishing that early in the fight, he's gonna need to get an earlier finish because rounds four and five are for sure going to Moreno if, if Pantoja has not worked on something to slow down a guy like Brandon Moreno. So for me, the pick is Pantoja. I feel pretty good about it. I've bet him quite a bit already. He's an underdog, and I think that's silly after he's beaten the guy twice and finished him once. So let me know what you guys think. I know a lot of people love the Brandon Moreno side. It's just not me this time. I'd love to hear from you, though, even if you are on the Moreno side. I'll see you guys in the main event. We got a good main one. Main event of the evening. Last reminder, like this video, please. I appreciate it very much. Something else I'd like you to do that doesn't cost you a penny, take this video, send it to a friend, post it in your office group chat, send it, you know, put it on your, your college group chat, Send it to your instructors. Ask them if they'll send it out to the whole class. Hey, tell them, hey, the Professor 138 sent, 138 MMA sent you and that they wanted you to send this out to the class. Get this out somewhere to somebody else that may enjoy it. I would appreciate it very much, and it doesn't cost you anything other than a few seconds and a couple of clicks. Now, let's break down this main event between Alexander the Great Volkanovsky and Yair Rodriguez. Rodriguez is 3-1-1 one, and one no contest in the last five. 4-1 for Volkanovski. That one loss is up at lightweight against Islam Makashev, which if you haven't seen the, the deep in-depth breakdown I did on that one, you can still find it on the channel. Sure, the fight's over, but it was an interesting breakdown. I got it right, but I said it was going to be a close fight, and that it was. Now, in this matchup here, another quick note. I'm going to plug the Patreon real quick because I didn't write all of the notes up here because this is another one where I could have done a deep dive, but I felt like I had way more notes on Volkanovski just because we have such a big sample size of the guy. The guy's in there for you know, five rounds a lot of the times, it goes the distance, all that good stuff. So if you'd like to see all of the notes I had in this one, patreon.com slash 138MMA is where you find it. Now, for Yair Rodriguez, dude is a solid striker with a dynamic attack. He's got excellent footwork and a heck load of speed. You catch what I did there? That was keeping it for the, for the ads and stuff, keeping it simple. Now, got the speed, he's got good combinations where he's gonna mix up all of his strikes, whether that's the punch, the kicks, the knees, the elbows, Get the, he's got deadly kicks to all levels, and he can put those in combination as well. Whether that's a spinning kick or a standard leg kick, whatever he's doing, he can put it in combination. He's got nasty elbows and knees that go along with that. The problem is his striking defense isn't the best. A lot of times he's looking more for offense than he is for defense. Now, his jiu-jitsu is good. It's, 
getting there. He's got a growing submission game, but his takedown defense isn't the best, and he can be held down sometimes. But on the feet, he is extremely dangerous. But he's going up against a guy in Alexander Volkanovsky who is an excellent striker. Sure, he doesn't have the, that one-shot power that you see from a guy like Yaya Rodriguez, but he's got a great control of the range. He'll move in, land his shots, and get back out all before his opponent's been able to react to it, do anything about it. He's got excellent feints. He's, his strikes are very quick, and he's going to cut off the cage and back his opponent up against the, 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 the wall or the fence. He's going to stick to his leg kicks, too, with accumulation. He's going to start landing them early in a fight and just keep on them over and over throughout the whole fight to slow the opponent down. And slowing down a guy like Yari Rodriguez is a great game plan that he's probably going to use. And he's going to mix his combinations as well, whether he's going to throw the leg kick, come over with the strikes, come from the strikes, throw the leg kick, mix up the body kicks, whatever he needs to do. He's going to mix his punches and kicks in his combinations, and I do like that a lot. When it comes to the grappling, Alex Volkanovski is going to be the better grappler here, and I don't think that that's crazy to say. Volkanovski does mix the takedowns in with his strikes, which is super important because his wrestling background isn't there. He doesn't have a wrestling background, but he, similar to something like a GSP, he learned to wrestle through MMA, and he can throw, start throwing his strikes and go right into the takedowns. And I think that's actually a slight advantage that people that learn wrestling from MMA get over pure wrestlers, something like a Bo Nickel we saw before, where they're looking for the takedown. Volkanovski's looking to strike into a takedown fluid in accommodation. And that's something that guys that learn wrestling through MMA have that wrestlers don't. Now, if you've been wrestling your whole life, you're probably going to be better with the technique. Don't get me wrong. But that's just the one bonus. Now, he's a good takedown defense, except his leg kicks can be caught. And now somebody's pointed out in the uh, Islam Makashev fight that his leg kicks can be caught. If Yair gets on top and just starts looking for a sub from the top, I don't think he's going to get it. But it might win him a round. Uh, so it's it's something the the only weakness I found in Volkanovski there's two he doesn't have one shot knockout power and he also can be taken down off his leg kicks doesn't have a whole lot of, of negatives outside of that um, but he does get up when he's not when he's taken down and scoot himself to the cage work himself back up and he's very physically strong so he can do that heck of a scrambler and when he gets on top of you his ground and pound is nasty he's not doing this the little like hammers like this he's getting up to his feet and throwing big shots down like he's trying to put your head through the canvas. He does a very good job with the ground and pound, and he's very safe when he's doing so. Even if he gets locked into submission, he's able to get out. We saw it against Ortega. We've seen it in many other fights where if somebody got, has him in a, in a hold, when the Ortega fight is obviously the most clear example. He gets out. It doesn't matter how deep that is. And he can sweep when he's on the bottom. The only person he's really struggled to do that with is, uh, is Islam Makhachev. And that's understandable because Makachev's one of the best grapplers in the UFC. Probably, he might even be the best grappler in the UFC. He's one of the best grapplers in the UFC if he's not the best. And then Volkanovski has top-tier cardio, which is something that I can't say for Yair Rodriguez, who, I don't think he's got horrible cardio, but he doesn't have anywhere near the cardio of a guy like Volkanovski. Here's how this one shakes out. Volkanovski wins this fight 99 times out of 100, but that one time, Maybe not 99 out of 100. That's a little extreme. We'll say uh, at least 9 times out of 10. At least. Probably more. Volkanovski's probably winning this fight. But there is the chance of that one-shot KO that somebody like Rodriguez has. But when Volkanovski gets dropped, he does recover extremely quick. Gets back to his feet or secures a takedown or whatever he needs to do to let the cobwebs come out. But you can only do that so many times before it just puts you out. And he has been put out before in like his second fight or something like that way back in the day when he's fighting like welterweight. Makes sense. But either way, a guy like Gary Rodriguez can put your lights out in any moment. So he does have a puncher's chance. But I think Volkanovski wins this fight an overwhelming majority of the time. He's just one of the best fighters in the entire world. And I think it's going to be really hard for a guy like Rodriguez who doesn't have the full game just yet. He's still missing a lot of the grappling, and, he's, and his striking does leave some holes with that defense. So for me, Volkanovski has to be the pick. I appreciate you guys staying through this whole breakdown. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate all of you tuning into the channel, whether it's your first time here. Welcome to the channel. Thank you so much. Or if you're a returning viewer, a longtime viewer, I appreciate all of you. Check out the channel memberships. Check out all that good stuff. You can even put a super thanks or whatever it is in the comments here. That's super awesome. Super thanks. Super awesome. I appreciate all of you. See you guys soon. Party hard.